is a great pleasure and honor for me to be invited by Eastern Asia University, the National Defense Studies Institute, the Royal Thai Armed Forces, and the Federation of Thai Industries to deliver a keynote speech on the important and timely topic of the future of our cities. Great civilizations have been built on the back of great cities. Athens was the cradle of democracy. Rome was the epicenter of its own great empire. And the remains of Southeast Asia's empires can still be seen at Hong Kong, Ayurveda, and Sukhothai. More recently, in the 19th and 20th century, London, New York, and Tokyo was the catalyst of the Industrial Revolution on their respective continents. Cities remain the main drivers of countries' economic and social development. They concentrate capabilities and economies, breed innovation, and drive productivity. People are attracted to cities because of the opportunity they promise for wealth, for education, and a longer and healthier life. People throughout Asia, from China to Indonesia, India, Thailand, and the Philippines have already started to dream of wealth and opportunity. And our own wave of urbanization is taking place at an astonishing space. According to the United Nations, Asia's urbanization rate is the fastest in the world, leading all others as part of the global megatrend. Today, less than half of Asia's population lives in one city. By 2050, that figure will increase to two-thirds. Asia will have over 3 billion people living in a city. The 21st century will be an era of thriving Asian megacities. But urbanization brings with it new challenges for all its benefits, for all the comparative advantage and opportunities cities provide. They reach a the tipping point, a threshold where overpopulated cities designed for a bygone era cannot cope with the pace of modern urbanization. Poor municipal governance, unplanned urban development, poor administration of planning and construction permits, growing inequality and poverty, emergence of slums, poor water and waste management, power shortages, greater impacts from extreme weather events or natural disasters, poor provision of basic social services such as health and education, traffic congestion, pollution and crime are all exacerbated in unsustainable major cities. Rural to urban migration has been a driver of growth in Southeast Asia. But driving through contested, polluted streets of Manila, Jakarta, or even here in Bangkok shows that there are limits to the benefits of urbanization. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in Asia, more than other continent on Earth, our mega cities will be at the great, greatest risk from the effects of the climate change. The statistics provided by climate change experts tell a harrowing story. Last year, we experienced Earth's warmest year on record. Indeed, 14 of the 15 hottest, year, hottest years on record have occurred since the turn of the millennium. The latest report issued by the International Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, predicts that without mitigation measures, the global mean surface temperature is likely to increase 3.7 to 4.8 degrees compared to the pre-industrial levels. For the world to have a fighting chance at survival, the IPCC suggests that we cannot let the temperature get above 2 degrees of the pre-industrial levels. At present, ladies and gentlemen, we are already halfway there. The United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced that 
the concentration of the CO2 in the atmosphere surpassed 400 parts per million in March 2015, for the first time in recorded history. Rising global temperatures will result in the melting of the polar ice caps and glaciers enough to have a major impact on the sea levels. Projections estimate sea level rises of up to two meters by the end of the century. Not only will some island nations disappear from the map entirely, but the rising sea level will threaten low-lying population centers like Bangkok, Singapore, and also in Bangladesh. Extreme weather events, droughts, floods, extreme heat waves, and cold snaps wildfires and severe storms like typhoons and cyclones will become more frequent and intense. They will range from common new senses, such as flash floods, which disrupted the morning commute of many of us in Bangkok last week, to the truly devastating, such as Cyclone Nargis in Myanmar in 2009, or the Typhoon Yolanda, which hit the Philippines in 2013. Asia, in particular Southeast Asia and its cities, will increasingly have to pay an economic and human cost for the extreme weather events associated with the climate change. The statistics and facts will be a surprise to none of us here. For the past decade, we have heard them over and over again at regular intervals, the United Nations, the IPCC, and other researchers reiterate the impact of climate change as their science gets stronger. The scientific debate on the validity of man-made climate change and the urgent need to employ drastic measures to mitigate against its impacts is over. The science is irrefutable. Every day, the effects of climate change are increasingly evident, and the time we have left to deal with it is diminishing. But. Despite this damning evidence, despite evident and obvious impacts already occurring, despite the effect that we have on our lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren in future generations, why? Why is it still so hard to get the global consensus on what we have to do to overcome it? Since the Kyoto Protocol, a global commitment to combating climate change has not been forthcoming. Small steps, bilateral, minilateral agreements such as the US-China joint announcement on climate change agreed in Beijing last year are being made. Similarly, the European Union's 28 member states have long championed clean and green innovation. Germany is now a world leader in renewable energy. Just last week in Bavarian Alps, the G7 committed to a process of decarbonization that is not only reducing but ending their reliance on fossil fuels. They are now aiming to focus on innovative, efficient and clean green technologies, elimination of fossil, fossil fuel subsidies, a focus on resource efficiency and perhaps more importantly, incentivizing low carbon growth opportunities, creating a low-carbon society. This agreement between the world's leading economies of G7 should be a template for what can be achieved in the developing world. In the developing world, the long-term progress is not so optimistic. ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations of 10 countries, has attempted to address climate change through a number of measures, most notably, in this ASEAN Sociocultural Community Blueprint, a primary pillar to the AEC or the ASEAN Economic Community and the ASEAN Political and Security Community, three pillars of the ASEAN Community. So far, short-term progress has actually been steady and shown some early promise. The ASEAN Sociocultural Community Blueprint prioritizes 11 major issues under the Ensuring Environmental Sustainability umbrella, ranging from, where possible, presenting a common ASEAN position on multilateral environmental agreements, 
to implementing measures to eliminate the perennial transboundary is solution.